Hi friends, and welcome to this week's episode. Today I'm going to be talking about osteoporosis, which is a subject that many of you have asked me to chime in on, so let's just dive right in. Well, first of all, what's the definition of osteoporosis? Well, just from its name, you can understand that it means our bones become more porous with time. So there are two types of cells in our bone, one that is constantly building new bone and the other one that's constantly degenerating the old bone. And as we get older, those bone builders start acting more slowly than the bone breaking down cells. And so we start to lose bone over time. Now, when we were younger, those two were in balance. In fact, up until about age 30, the bone builders were often more active than the ones that broke bone down. But as we get older, that balance shifts. And so we're losing more bone than we're building every year and our bone density drops. Now there's some important things to understand about what our bones look like on the inside. The inside of the bone called spongy bone or trabecular bone is the most active where it's turning over the most quickly. So that's actually the part that is affected the most as we get older. And if you look at it under a microscope, that type of bone is actually not solid. It kind of looks like a honeycomb. It has little holes in it and this really fine network. But the holes are pretty small when we're younger. And then as we get older, as we lose bone density, the holes can get really big. And so that whole inside structure of the bone gets really fragile. You can imagine just like a building frame as the holes get bigger when we have some type of traumatic injury or even something very minor like a fall from standing height or just reaching out an arm to lean against a counter can cause those bones to break, something very, very minor. And so those are called fragility fractures because the bone is so fragile that it can break without even much happening. In fact, you can spontaneously break a hip just walking when that bone density drops to a certain level. And on the outside of our bone, we have a dense core called cortical bone, which is that solid outside that you look at if you're looking at a bone from a human or an animal. It looks really solid on the outside, but if you cut it in half, it's actually spongy in the middle. Does that make sense? So both the cortical bone on the outside and the trabecular bone on the inside start to break down more quickly than it builds. But the trabecular bone is the most important where we see most of those changes because it is more active. So how do we diagnose osteoporosis? Well, it's tricky because it is called a silent disease because we don't have symptoms until we have a fracture. So if we have symptoms like pain or loss of height or something very obvious like a fragility fracture, we've already developed the problem that we would like to prevent. So the best idea, if we're lucky enough to be evaluated early, is to prevent getting osteoporosis in the first place. So first of all, I'm gonna talk to you about diagnosis and prevention, and then I'll talk to you about treatment. If you're not lucky enough to find out early and you already have osteoporosis, that is okay too. There are very good treatments that can help but the goal is prevention. So why is it a big deal? Well, first of all, it's incredibly common. Over 2 million fractures occur in the United States alone every year that are related to osteoporosis. And over 300,000 of those are hip fractures. And that's a big deal because if we break a hip, and we're over age 70, there's a 25% chance that we will die within the first year because we become immobilized and then all kinds of things happen, right? We can get an infection, we can get a blood clot, we start going downhill. So preventing that fracture in the first place is really important. And vertebral or spine fractures may not sound like such a big deal as a hip fracture, but they cause loss of height, pain, loss of mobility, all kinds of things that we also want to avoid. So the two places that we're most concerned about fracture is in the hip and the spine. Although fracture, of course, can occur anywhere. When it occurs in our wrist, that's a little bit easier to manage. But fractures in the hip and spine cause major problems and they're incredibly common. So we wanna try to do what we can to prevent that in the future if we're lucky enough to be hearing this when we don't have osteoporosis yet. So how do we check to see if we have this or not, or if we're at risk. Well, first of all, there are several groups that are higher risk than others. So 
part of your normal history and physical with your gynecologist should be going through that history, especially if you're menopausal, because the rate of bone loss really accelerates around the time of menopause. So if you're premenopausal, it's really unlikely that you'll be diagnosed with osteoporosis. In fact, we generally don't even check because premenopause, of course, you've got estrogen in your system, unless you've got some very unusual circumstance like cancer or being on certain drugs like steroids for a long time, or if you have an unexplained fragility fracture or something like that, we normally wouldn't even check until after menopause because it's menopause that really causes the problem to accelerate. So if you're over 50, we're gonna be looking to see what risk factors you have. So some of those are just so common, like being white or Asian, being small framed, having a family history. So having a parent, especially a mother who's had osteoporosis really elevates our risk. And then other things that are related to lifestyle like smoking, drinking excess alcohol, being deficient in protein, calcium, and vitamin D, and then certain drugs that you may have been prescribed, like long-term steroids that may be used for various diseases, as well as cancer treatment, and lots of other medications that might be relevant for your particular situation. But for the average healthy patient, who's 50 or older, we're gonna do some screening for those risk factors. And then we're gonna determine whether it's a good idea for you to have a bone density test. Well, the American College of OB-GYN says that everybody should have a bone density test when she's 65, but women under age 65 should have one if they have significant risk factors. And honestly, most of my patients have at least one or two of those things. So it's really rare that I would wait till 65 personally to do a bone density test. First of all, it's incredibly low risk, easy and inexpensive to do one, and you might pick up some really good information. So I recommend doing a bone density test for almost everybody, maybe when you've been postmenopausal for a few years, so that we can see what your baseline is and hopefully intervene before you get a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So you do your bone density test and it comes back with this score. There's two different scores. One is called a Z score, like zebra, and one is called a T score, like Tom. Well, the Z score compares you to other women your age. So it's kind of useless if you're postmenopausal because we don't care how you compare to other women your age. We really wanna see if you've lost bone compared to when you were younger. So the Z-score, we really never use unless we're talking about premenopausal women, which as I mentioned is really rare. So forget about the Z-score, we're gonna focus on the T-score. So this might mean you've gotta dig out some old math and remember your statistics, but the T-score has this basic assumption that at some point in your life, you started out with a score of zero. Now that's a big assumption because you may never have started with a score of zero, but the assumption is that when we were, say 25 or 30, we had a T-score of zero. So the T-score of zero is comparing you to a perfectly healthy white woman, age 25 to 30. So there's a lot of ways that that could be incorrect for you in particular as an individual. Now, if you're somebody like me who's very small framed white woman, you probably never had a T-score of zero. In fact, I know I didn't because I was in med school and I checked. <laughs> now, you really shouldn't do a bone density test when you're 30, but one of the fun things about being a doctor is you get to sometimes do tests that are not recommended for other people. <laughs> so I did that. And when I was 30, I had a T-score of minus one. Well, what does that mean? That just means that my maximum don't bone density was minus one, it was never zero. And minus one would imply that I've lost some bone when in fact, I hadn't lost any bone, I started out at minus one. So keep that in mind. But when we're looking at T-scores in general, we're assuming that you started at around zero and then negative numbers, of course, indicate that you've lost bone. So if you're postmenopausal, you're never gonna have a positive number. I don't think I've ever seen that in my career. You're gonna have some kind of negative number and that would be normal. So numbers between zero and minus one are considered to be normal. We don't worry about that at all. Numbers between minus one and minus 2.5 fall into this diagnosis, if we wanna call it that, of osteopenia. Now osteopenia isn't really a medical condition. It's just a name given to that particular group of patients who appear to have lost some bone 
but do not have enough bone loss to reach the diagnosis of osteoporosis. So it's not a real medical diagnosis to be told you have osteopenia. It's just an indication that it's possible that you've lost some bone. Now we don't know until we see that it decreases over time because again, you, you might have started with a T-score of minus 1.1 or something that would give you that diagnosis. But in general, it's fair enough to assume that if you have a T-score of minus one to minus 2.5, that's osteopenia, it's reasonable to assume that you've lost some bone. Well, that wouldn't be surprising because everybody loses bone as we get older and it especially accelerates around the time of menopause. But I actually really like getting that diagnosis for patients because it's kind of like finding out that you have precancer. You don't have cancer yet and it's totally treatable and everything's great. It's kind of a wake up call saying, hey, I need to really focus on this and do something about it. And then we will not get the ultimate diagnosis of osteoporosis. So as bone density continues to drop, once we get numbers of less than minus 2.5, so minus 2.5, minus three, and so on, that's where we get the diagnosis of osteoporosis. So you can see it's just a continuum. It's not like something terrible all of a sudden happens when we reach minus 2.5. It's just a slow decline. And remember, those numbers are totally made up. They're just indicators of what level of concern we need to have. But if we have osteoporosis, it does not mean that we'll have a fracture. It doesn't mean anything bad will happen. It just increases our risk. So we can do some analysis using the bone density test and also looking at your risk factors and come up with a percentage chance that you'll have a fracture within the next 10 years. So there's a scoring system called the FRAX tool, F-R-A-X, that's really easy to do that gives you the chance that you'll have a fracture in the next 10 years. So of course, this is all just statistics and all sort of made up, but using that tool is another way to determine whether you need to be treated. So osteoporosis could be diagnosed in a couple of different ways. One would be if you have a T-score of lower than minus 2.5. Now that would be one way. Again, that doesn't mean anything bad will happen. It just suggests that your risk is increased. Or it could also be diagnosed if you do the little FRAX tool if your doctor does it in the office, and you have a 20% risk or greater of having a fracture within the next 10 years, regardless of your T-score. Because some people's T-score does not tell the whole picture for reasons that I explained. And I'll tell you another reason. The bone density test is really only looking at the density of the cortical bone. It's not really able to measure the trabecular bone. And so you could have really strong cortical bone and have the honeycomb completely disintegrated in the middle and the bone density test would not pick that up. So it makes sense to look at multiple different ways to assess your risk. So another way to diagnose osteoporosis is simply if you've had an unexplained fragility fracture. So for example, if you leaned over and bumped the wall and broke your wrist, or had a hip fracture from walking down the street, you would be diagnosed with osteoporosis regardless of what your T-score was. So several different ways to diagnose osteoporosis, but primarily it's done with the DEXA scan. So again, make sure that the T-score doesn't freak you out. I have so many patients who come and see me absolutely terrified because they were told that they have osteopenia when again, remember, that just indicates that your T-score is somewhere between 1 and minus 2.5, and mine is in that range, but it's been there for a long time. So what's more important is seeing if it changes over time. If you think about it, if we were left alone, our bone density would change over time. It's on a downward trajectory if left to nature. So even if your bone density stays the same over time, that's considered to be a win because it's not dropping. And this is really just one of the hazards that has happened from living so long because bone loss is something that's been going on since humans have been on the planet, but we haven't lived long enough really to run into so many problems until the last 100 years or so. So now that most of us are gonna to live to be greater than 80 years old, Again, I mentioned 35% of women over 80 have osteoporosis. We're going to see that this becomes a whole lot more common. So it's really important to find ways to intervene early. So let's just say you have a bone density test and you're my age, you're 55, and your T-score is minus 1.8. I'll make up a number. That means you have osteopenia. 
not osteoporosis. And let's just say you're someone like me. You're a thin white or Asian woman with a family history of osteoporosis. You're going to be considered at high risk, like me, to get osteoporosis over time. So it's really important to start thinking about ways to prevent it. Well, first of all, we talk about lifestyle. Exercise is really important because when we're using our bones with weight, we're constantly banging on those bones and causing the cells to turn over more quickly. So we're gonna activate those bone builder cells. So any type of weight bearing exercise is really gonna help to keep our bones strong. And we see that sedentary women, especially sedentary small framed white and Asian women have the highest risk, particularly if they smoke that's an independent risk factor, or drink too much alcohol, another independent risk factor, and too much alcohol is defined as more than one alcoholic drink a day. So that's a lot of us in that group, I know. So if you're in this group, which I certainly am, we wanna start thinking about what we can do to improve our bone health. So exercise, don't smoke. If you are someone who has to take steroid medication for any particular condition, see if there may be an alternative because those drugs do accelerate bone loss. And then back to my favorite topic, hormone replacement. Why does bone loss accelerate after menopause? Well, it's because our estrogen drops. So replacing estrogen in the first five years after menopause, if we can, is your best bet at avoiding osteoporosis. And guess what? <laughs> Testosterone also is very positive for preventing bone loss. And that's been shown in many studies of men, men with low testosterone also develop osteoporosis. So for women, a combination of estrogen and testosterone is protective and will slow down the rate of bone loss. So along with all the other reasons to take your hormone replacement, if you are menopausal, the reason we start getting osteopenia in the first place is because of estrogen depletion. So all of the drugs that lower estrogen, like anti-cancer drugs and the Depo-Provera injection that lowers out estrogen, anything that lowers estrogen increases the risk of bone loss. So it's kind of a no-brainer, in my humble opinion, to get on your estrogen right at the time of menopause, and that will slow down this whole process of bone loss. In fact, hopefully it will halt it altogether. In fact, if you're someone like me, you might see that your bone density actually improves. So my T-score actually went up in the past three years, which is really almost unheard of. Certainly for someone who wasn't on hormones, it would be unheard of. So if we can keep it the same or even make it go up, isn't that a wonderful thing? So number one, hormone replacement. That is the number one two and three thing that we can do to prevent developing bone loss as we get older. And then what is bone made of? Well, it's made of a lot of minerals, but some of the most important ones are calcium, that would be number one, and magnesium. So getting plenty of that in your diet is really important as well. So how much calcium do we need? Well, many studies have shown that a thousand milligrams a day is adequate calcium intake for the average person. And the best way to get that is through our diet. So calcium supplements are not easy to absorb. In fact, when I was a younger physician, we were taught that every woman should take 1200 milligrams of calcium a day in the form of two capsules that were 600 milligrams each. Well, we did that for quite a few years and it was shown that we were not absorbing that calcium. It actually was shown not to reduce the risk of fracture. And the only thing that it did do was increase the chance that you'll get kidney stones because most of that calcium is not absorbed, but it's just passed through our kidneys and it can coagulate into crystals that form kidney stones. So calcium supplementation is important if you don't get enough in your diet. If you're someone like me who doesn't do dairy or very little, taking a calcium supplement will be important. Now you cannot absorb very much at the same time. So what we've learned is that you really don't need to get the whole thousand milligrams in the form of a supplement because you're going to be getting some in your diet. Hopefully you're gonna get all of it in your diet. For example, a serving of dairy has about 300 milligrams of calcium. So if you had two or three of those a day, maybe some milk, some yogurt, cheese, whatever it is that you prefer, you're going to get very close to that thousand milligrams just with the dairy. And then calcium's also in lots of vegetables like broccoli and kale. It's in fish that has bones in it, like salmon, sardines. 
I don't need any of that <laughs> except the broccoli and kale. So I take a calcium supplement and I actually like this one. I'll show you the one I take. Um, it's by Thorn, of course, because Thorn's my favorite for everything related to supplements. This is called OSCAP. O-S-C-A-P. It has 300 milligrams of calcium along with some magnesium and vitamin D. And it's really easy. I take two in the morning and two at night because that gives me 600 milligrams. And then I get some in my diet from vegetables and other things. So best source of calcium is definitely dietary. So we do not recommend supplements for everybody, only patients who don't get enough in their diet. So take a look at your daily intake of calcium. Do a little study for a few days and see how much you get and then you can see if you need to take calcium or not. Now magnesium is another element that's very important for bone formation and it has been shown that a magnesium deficiency in the diet is associated with osteoporosis. Now it's pretty unlikely that you're magnesium deficient if you have a normal diet but a little bit of magnesium in the supplement doesn't hurt just in case. And then all of us have heard about vitamin D and the importance of vitamin D for calcium absorption. And there's so much controversy about how much we need. So you can get vitamin D from sitting in the sun. Now, I don't do that because I have this white skin and a history of skin cancer. So I do need to take vitamin D in the form of a supplement. So how much do you need? Well, that depends on the person. And so most doctors like me, prefer to draw your blood and measure the serum level of your vitamin D3. And there's some controversy about what those numbers should be, but in our office, we like it to be somewhere between 50 and 100. So vitamin D has a lot of benefits, not only for our bones, we also know for immune health, for thyroid function, lots of other things. So I like to keep it a little bit on the higher side and there's no downside to keeping it at that level. Now over 100 is unnecessary, can actually lead to some other issues, but around 50 to 100 is a good place to be. So for me, I need to take 5,000 international units of vitamin D3 daily to get to that level because without it, my vitamin D level is almost zero. Now somebody else might need way less than that. So the important thing is to check it and see what your level is and keep it in that range. Most labs will say that normal is anything over 30. But between 30 and 50, I would still consider it to be a little bit too low. So important thing is to check it. I would check it at least annually and then replace it if you need to. So vitamin D is one of the fat soluble vitamins, which means that it's stored in our body fat. So you actually don't have to take it every day. You can take it once a week. You can take it every other day, whatever is easier for you. So there are some forms of vitamin D that come in a weekly preparation, others that come daily. The important thing is that you get your blood levels to that 50 to 100 mark. Now, regarding calcium, I have a lot of patients ask me about, well, my blood level of calcium look normal. Does that mean that my bones are okay? And actually your blood level of calcium doesn't tell us a whole lot about what your bones are doing. In fact, if it's high, in your blood, it can be because you're breaking bone down too quickly. So it's a little bit opposite to what you might think. If you have a high level of calcium in your bloodstream, that does not necessarily mean that you've got good calcium in your bones. In fact, it might mean the opposite. So we can't really assess how your bones are doing with a blood calcium level. But if you have been diagnosed with osteoporosis, there are some additional tests like urine calcium and other things that can determine how much calcium we are actually absorbing from our bones. Another vitamin that's important for bone health is vitamin K. And so a lot of vitamin D preparations now have vitamin K and D together. So I actually take one that has all three fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, and K. So you may have seen a product called ADK 5000 or ADK 10,000, depending on how much you need. That's one that I personally take. And my blood levels have been really good starting from terribly low. <laughs> now they're back to being stable and I actually just take mine Monday, Wednesday, Friday now since I've got my levels up to where they need to be. So we've talked about the prevalence. It's really common. We've talked about the risk factors, which is basically just being a woman and going through menopause counts, plus some other risk factors like genetics, body frame size, smoking, alcohol use, family history, all of those things. But long story short, I think it just makes sense to test because it's an easy test to do, minimal radiation, very inexpensive, and I like to get a baseline somewhere after you've been through menopause for a few years. Now, if it comes back normal, meaning your T-score is greater than minus one, you don't need to test again for at least five years. If it comes back with osteopenia, I would start with the interventions that we've talked about, like 
lifestyle changes if we need to make them, get on your hormone replacement, take your calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and then check again in a couple of years because the changes that happen in bone are so slow that you may not actually see any real change in a year. The DEXA scan has got a little margin of error so that a small change might fall within that margin of error if it's done more frequently than every two years. So the only patient that we would check annually or even more frequently would be in someone who's got pretty severe osteoporosis and we wanna make sure that it's not getting worse. So if you have osteopenia or normal bone density, we would still want you to start on your hormone replacement, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, exercise, don't smoke, get off any drugs that could be harmful, all of those good things, and then reassess it periodically. Now, what if the bone density test comes back with a T-score of less than minus 2.5? Now you've been told you have osteoporosis, and that can be really scary, but just remember it does not mean that you will have a fracture, it just means that your risk is elevated. So again, back to the same lifestyle changes, hormone replacement, vitamins, calcium, magnesium, and on top of that, we'll be talking about different treatment options that you could consider. So there are several different classes of bone builder drugs. I'm not a big fan of any of them, <laughs> to be honest, because all of them have side effects. But if I had to take one, I'll tell you which one I would choose. And then I'll tell you about the pros and cons of some of the others. Well, in the realm of things that can help with bone density, other than lifestyle changes, the first one is hormone replacement and vitamins. So we've already talked about that. That's number one and two. And then if we're talking about other drugs, I'll just go through the ones that are out there. It doesn't necessarily mean that I support any of them. Now there's a medication called Avista that you might've heard of, Riloxifen in the same family. Those are called SERMS, S-E-R-M-S. This particular medication acts like estrogen at the level of the bone. Now, unfortunately, it acts as an anti-estrogen at the level of your brain. So it gives you horrible hot flashes, night sweats, and other symptoms, but it is good for your bones. And it's also been shown to reduce the incidence of breast cancer, which is cool, but because it works by acting like estrogen, I say just let's take estrogen. So it got popular back in the old days when we were worried about the risks of estrogen. So 20 years ago when we thought that estrogen caused cancer, that was a really great idea to have something alternative to estrogen. But now that we're much more comfortable with the risks of estrogen being very, very low or zero for most patients, I would never prescribe that medication, I'll just tell you. So it is out there, but I don't see any reason to take it if you can take estrogen because that's the reason that it works because it acts like estrogen. Well, there's several other classes of drugs. There's one called calcitonin, which often comes in a nasal spray. That's pretty much been left by the side of the road now because it actually didn't show that it decreased the risk of hip fractures over time. It acts like a hormone that we make in our own body that does improve calcium absorption, but I never prescribed that one either. There's another one called Forteo, which is an injectable medication that also acts like parathyroid hormone. That's another hormone that helps calcium uptake. But again, that is rarely prescribed because there is one other medication that just seems to work better, and that is called Prolia. So if I had to take one, I would take Prolia. The good thing about it is it's given just twice a year. You can use it long term, whereas most of these other medications are only safe to use for a short period of time. Uh, and it has been shown to decrease the risk of fracture in patients who have osteoporosis. So if you had to take anything, hormone replacement, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and prolia will improve your bone density over time and reduce your risk of fracture. So I missed a whole class of drugs there called bisphosphonates, like Fosamax, Boniva, others in that class. And those might be the ones that are given most commonly, but I will tell you, I don't like them uh, personally because they have a lot of side effects. You have to take them first thing in the morning and then wait before you eat. Otherwise you can get heartburn, don't lie down. There's a lot of different difficulties about taking them. And the GI side effects can be pretty rough as well as some other side effects, including a very rare, but not good problem called osteonecrosis of the jaw. Now that is extremely rare, but 
we don't want it. So if you can get away without taking a bisphosphonate, that's what I would do. It's also been shown that long-term use of bisphosphonates, meaning longer than three to five years, can actually increase the risk of a different type of fracture called atypical fractures. One of the reasons that happens is that bisphosphonates like Fosamax and others in that class increase the density of the cortical bone on the outside but they don't do much for the trabecular bone, so they don't help with bone flexibility. They can make your bone very hard and very brittle at the same time. And so long-term use of those drugs has been shown not to work. And so we want to be on something, I would think, that we can take throughout our lives. Because when we stop any of these things, whether it's estrogen or any of these medications, the bone loss comes right back again. So we need to be on something that we can take through the end of life because if we stop it, the bone loss starts accelerating right away again. So none of these last for a long time. So if we stop estrogen or any of these medications, the problem just comes right back, which is why we want to take something, in my opinion, that we can take for a long time. And so far that would be estrogen, testosterone, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, sound like a broken record, plus or minus prolia. So Currently, that's the best drug that we have out there, in my humble opinion, and we're getting new ones all the time. None of the drugs that I just mentioned were even available when I was in medical school. We didn't have anything other than prescribing the wrong amount of calcium that just caused kidney stones. So the amount of research and advancement that's taken place in the field of osteoporosis just in the last 25 years is really dramatic and very exciting. So hopefully, those of us who are in our 50s we're going to have a much lower incidence of osteoporosis than our mothers, like my dear mother who's got terrible osteoporosis. She's lost four inches and broken so many bones we've lost count. But hopefully I won't continue down that path because I'm doing something different. Now in my case, I mentioned my T-score actually improved over time. Well, guess what I'm taking? Estrogen, testosterone, vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, that's it. I exercise, I don't smoke, and I try to drink less than one alcoholic drink a day. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not, but those are the most important things that we can do regarding our lifestyle. So just to summarize, if you are menopausal, we're gonna assume that you're losing bone because it's happening to all of us, and we need to get serious about those non-medication ways, lifestyle changes, hormones, vitamins, supplements, minerals, nutrition that help support our bones. And if we've got risk factors, which is most people, I would do a bone density test fairly early on in menopause to see where you're starting, repeat it as necessary. And if you do have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, don't panic. There are great medications along with the lifestyle changes, hormones, vitamins, supplements that I've already mentioned that can allow you to build bone. So the really important thing is not to get into a state where you've got severe osteoporosis and it's a big surprise because if you've been followed and been tested appropriately, knock on wood, we'll never get to that point. So if you're lucky enough to find out early, like me, Fingers crossed, we're gonna be just fine. And if you weren't lucky enough to find out early, that is okay. There are some great medications that can help your bones to be stronger as you get older. So that is a lot of information. You now know more about osteoporosis than most of your doctors. So if you like this episode, don't forget to share it with your friends and subscribe. And if you've got other topics like this that you'd like me to talk about, don't forget to write about those in the comments below. And I can't wait to see you next week.